Hey, welcome to the 137th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by new patrons Christopher Hall, Lucas Miller, and Seth Jurgen. I'm Oren Kaplan. And I'm Matt Enlow. Today we've got a listener Q&A episode. It's packed with all sorts of juicy tidbits about going to film school, starting your own production company, splitting up with creative partnerships, and a little bit of follow-up. It's another great episode. I can't wait to get into it. Oren and I have been up to a bunch of crazy stuff, so it's kind of been a while since we've caught up. So without further ado, Oren, yeah. um, I, I'm genuinely dying to know, what have you been working on lately? I know, it's weird. We have not actually hung out or talked to each other for quite a while because while well, you were away working on a lot of various projects and I was in London for 10 days. Yeah, we're, we're a pair of jet setters. Yeah. Which it was feels fancy. Fun. I went not for work, but for fun. My friend is there working and we got to visit the set and it's crazy. It's like hundreds of millions of dollars and after a take they're like hmm was there like a weird glare there and like is her hair kind of sticking up like they literally say the exact same thing that we say oh man on our low budget shoots there is nothing shoots. better you could have said frankly uh, like like you want to know that it's still hard that it's still like huh that's weird do you know what i mean yeah to me the biggest difference by far <laughs> is that you know you and i might shoot a feature in like 20 days and they'll shoot a feature in like 250 days <laughs> right yeah. um yeah so it was it was really cool to see and it's fun i'm really excited for the movie to come out um but uh unfortunately i'm not allowed to say anything to sign an yeah, nda I, i'm surprised that you even said the name of the movie hmm <laughs> <laughs> should we bleep it yeah Let's bleep it. <laughs> yeah, we probably ought to bleep it. Because now that I think about it, like even on set, it doesn't say the name of the movie anywhere. Oh, uh, that's so funny. But yes. So I was in London and, you know, just did a bunch of touristy stuff. Had my two and a half year old in tow, which was very difficult <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and agonizing, but it was fun. Um, and the week right before that, I shot some spots for Keebler Crackers. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were with Angela Kinsey from The Office. Are those spots up yet? So the first one is up. But as usual, I mean, this thing, I mean, I talk about this all the time, but I got a copy of the footage and I have like all my own cuts of the spots. And, you know, obviously I have some preference for my cuts. And so kind of as they, there's three spots we shot. So as they come out, I will put my director's cut on my my website. And so the first one just came out. So I haven't put it up yet, but I'll put it up this week. What are the big differences between the cuts that you prefer and the cuts that they change a little bit? Like what are the things that they tend to tweak or mess up in your opinion? Well, it's funny because right before we started recording this podcast, you showed me some cuts from these spots that you just shot and you know, they're 15 second spots, right? Uh, 30s. Oh, they're 30s. Yeah. But I guess half of them is like kind of text and yeah, yeah. VO and stuff, right? So that's the misleading thing about a 30. You're like, oh my God, I have all this time. And it's still like mostly ad copy. Right. Like yeah, you're it, lucky if you get 20 seconds out of that time, maybe 22. Yeah. And it's frustrating when like the agency people don't realize that where you're like, okay, we need three seconds for the end card. We need six seconds for this opening montage. We need... 29 seconds for this dialogue that's like a 37 second commercial you just yeah. gave me you'd think somebody if your whole and only job is making commercials that you would know that but. right well they always say like we'll just say it fast we'll just go fast but to me what it always means is we're gonna have to cut at least one line out of this which means i can no longer shoot it in a cool way it's not gonna be a one right i'm gonna have to shoot coverage we're gonna have to use that coverage so anyway um but uh, but even just talking about your spot that has like, I don't know, five cuts in it, I had a lot of opinions on on why I would go from one cut to another cut. So with these spots, they're, th they're 30s. They're kind of like loose 30s because they're digital spots. But I kind of felt like their cut was a little slow for my taste. I remade all the graphics in a way that I thought was much cooler. 
I like recolored things. There's a bunch of product shots. So basically we had Angela Kinsey from the office for four hours. And the way we scheduled our day is we're going to set up, we're going to shoot with her for four hours, all the dialogue stuff. And then at lunchtime, she has to leave to go do some other PR stuff. And we have all afternoon, another four hours to shoot all the product shots. And we had a hand model that had the same manicure that Angela had and everything. So she could pick up the crackers and do all that stuff. But of course, lunch ends and like 10 minutes into us shooting our product shots, the fire marshal shows up and apparently the stage that we're shooting on hasn't passed some sort of inspection and now they're shutting us down. So they're like, Oren, uh, they're kicking us out. Like we can probably hold off the fire marshal for like 20 minutes. You got to get all your product shots in 20 minutes. Uh, so now so brutal. I know. And I had all these like cool dolly shots and it's like, you know, John Petter was shooting and it was a friend of ours who's like kind of a perfectionist like literally and, and like super good yeah he's, now, like we always work with great dps but like john is like a great dp yeah so it's like you feel bad about like toning him down right and so as an example there's this shot where this like little side table slides into into frame and it has four cracker boxes on it so john had a separate light for each cracker box and like different bounces for each cracker box and because the table slides in you don't want it to be obvious that it's sliding into the light. So he has everything on dimmers and this whole crew of electricians like ready to dim the lights up and get the shot perfect. Plus there's a camera move. And this is, you know, I think a lot of experienced filmmakers know this uh, and inexperienced filmmakers don't know this, but the product shots often take way longer than anything else because you're trying to make the product look perfect. We literally, one of the cracker boxes, every time we picked it up and put it on the table, just the act of picking it up and bringing it on the table like would get a smudge on it or would crease the cardboard in an unflattering way. Anyway, so because we had so little time, none of our product shots were perfect. So one of the things in my cuts is I bring the product shots into After Effects and I get rid of all the creases. And if the box looks a little weird, I'll you know uh, do some visual effects fixes. I'll relight everything so that everything feels even. So that's the do type of ever- thing offer that to the client are you ever like hey guys i'm probably gonna do this yeah well first of all my production company gets really upset with me when i offer like free vfx services to clients sure fair uh but i do on this one specifically i was like hey by the way i touched up three product shots here they are they did not use them for the first cut i haven't seen their second and third Mm -hmm. spots yet uh but they did i did send them my cuts and i did see that they changed out almost all their takes for the takes that i used um Mm. And then, yeah, what's odd is their cut actually has like some improv lines that I pitched, uh, but I didn't use them in my cut just because they took too long. You know, improv always Mm -hmm. like kind of slows down an edit, in my opinion, unless it's like one line or one joke or we're replacing one thing. Right. Yeah. So I guess my cuts are just faster. They're zippier. They're fast. I often reframe every shot. I stabilize things. I do visual effects. I um, am very sensitive to like the colors from one shot to another so like if we have one the wide shot that has like a lot of blues and purples in it and we're cutting to an insert shot and it's on a yellow background i feel like it you kind of lose your orientation so i'll try to find a different part of that shot where we see at least a little blue or at least a little purple i like Hmm. the camera moves so anyway then my my cut it's like you could watch both cuts and probably barely notice the difference and you might even like their cut better because it takes its time more and maybe the jokes land a tiny bit better. But my cut, I think, is just more in line with the type of stuff that I like, which is like quick, fast. Also, they probably used five sound effects and my cut has like 85 sound effects. Yeah, sound is is like a thing. I feel like, especially in kind of like mid-range budget spots, oftentimes a producer will say like oh well we have a sound person and so then the editor will just kind of put in all of the fundamental baseline sounds of like anything that's important to story or cues and edit or something like that and they'll lay in a basic bed just to kind of put you in the the place and then assume that a sound designer will go through and actually kind of sweeten and, and boost all of that stuff and then the person they've hired for sound is just doing a mix so they've got you know, eight hours to do four different spots plus the the mixes on all of the social cutdowns and this and that, and whatever. And all of a sudden, there's no actual 
audio design, basically, unless you're doing it in the edit, basically. Right. And even if they did want to design, the edit isn't building in space for the audio. So I'll give you an example. In the spot, there's a part where Angela Kinsey complains about her uncle Bob. And then this hand, this hand with like a glove, kind of like a butler's hand comes in from off frame and like gives her a glass of champagne and she downs it and then hands it back. Um, I, I just kind of felt like while she was complaining about her uncle Bob, that line was like, I don't know, four seconds long. And it just seemed like a long time to be on this one line on this joke that was like mildly funny on this one shot that wasn't so entertaining until the the champagne comes in. So I had this idea, what if the this person who's like handing her all these things from off screen is like, we hear them preparing all the stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So that's funny. It, they actually ended up not using the champagne thing at all, probably because of that problem. Because they're like, well, we're just waiting for the champagne glass. But for me, I'm like, well, I have an easy solution because I love the champagne bit. And that's we hear the pot, we hear a, a cork pop, pop, and then even like we hear the hand smudging on the glass, we hear the liquid kind of moving when she puts it in front of it. We, when she downs it, I add like a, it's all really subtle, but all of a sudden there's like you're telling a story with the sound that is happening at the same time as the dialogue. And those are added jokes too, you know? Yeah. Like that's all set up to a, a punchline that like even if you just keep the punchline it's not funny unless you have the setup for it right and another huge thing i add is like there's a lot of um shots where these hands bring in plates with crackers on them from off screen and i just add little like ceramic the sound effect i used was from uh, called stacking plates someone Mm -hmm. just like stacking plates in a cupboard but it's just like these little clink 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 you know yeah and it just adds a little like like weight to every every time a hand comes in with a plate there's something funny about those sorts of sound effects that i don't have a great word for i'll kind of sometimes tell an editor or a sound designer like hey can you mickey mouse this a little bit which is like a term for basically when like every single little movement or action has a sound effect you know like mickey mouse back in the old days like every time he took a step it squeaked like squeak 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 you know yeah but that's not exactly what you mean well it's foley and also it's like fo- well, exactly what foley is right right but but it's not meant to sound accurate to what uh reality would depict right basically. but foley is always it's exaggerated. like you're plusing you're heightening basically with with um sound design but it's like there's a little bit of like um, subjectivity to it, right? Like the sound of these plates clinking isn't authentic to what it would sound like if you had, if you handed someone a plate, but it's still evocative of what you're trying to get across. And sometimes it can be literal and sometimes it's a couple steps removed and it's really hard to think through like, you know, maybe it's a a sword unsheathing, you know, it's kind of all the, the, uh, the language of like, trailer editing you know it's all like whooshes and suck suck backs and pianos and all of this sort of stuff that you you've heard a million times and may not even have the vocabulary to describe yeah you know i still kind of think like that those are two separate things foley which is like you know someone puts down a dollar bill on a table in real life like that doesn't make any sound but the foley artist will take a big piece of paper and drop it from high up on a table right and then we hear that, and it it just draws our attention to that action. Uh, the whooshes, the rises, the like tension things. I use a lot of those too, especially when I feel like something's not landing, and I kind of just need to, you know. Uh, and so in these spots, there's like these arms coming in from out of frame a lot, and I just added just these super subtle whooshes. Like arms don't really make a sound when you move them mm-hmm. in the air, but when you add those, it feels like they're more kinetic, you know? Yeah. So that's a very long answer to your question of how my edits are different than the agency's edits, but it's really subtle. I think the most drawn out thing is that I made these like 3D neon lights that had all the text and they have like just a straight graphic, like a 2D flat graphic. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. One last thing I want to mention about director's cuts, and this might be controversial, so hopefully I don't get in trouble, but... On my director's cuts, I use whatever freaking music I want. 
I do not uh, sure. license music. And in a real commercial, you can't do that. Uh, so I can use a famous song. I can use uh, just f- rip something from somewhere else. Uh, I really, in the director's cut, am thinking not about the distribution of the spot, more just right. what would make it feel the way I want it to feel. Yeah. So that's yeah. It. I don't think that's controversial. Well, I mean, I think posting videos. Well, let me ask with you this: When you music. post it on Vimeo or wherever it is, you host your. Do you host on Vimeo? What do you do? Yeah, for my website, I host on Vimeo. Yeah. So do you write um, Keebler, Crackers, Director's Cut? Yeah. Yeah. So then there you go. But I, that is code for like, hey, I kind of took some liberties and like, maybe this is really 31 and a half seconds, but like, I didn't want to trim it down quite so yeah. much or whatever. But I will actually, even if it's 35 seconds, I'll write 30, like colon 30 on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Because it, hopefully if it's not boring, then people won't notice that it's a little long. Oh, I did do, so on one of my cuts, someone at the Famous Group, Stefan said, I really like this one, but I feel like there's no real end card. And so I made my own end card in Cinema 4D, like with these cracker boxes animating. Uh, and I think it, I don't know, I think it came out pretty cool. I go, I'm going all out. I do not want to spend weeks working on a spot that I end up not liking and not wanting to use on my reel. I have started a new rule that I would make my unpaid endorsement, but fortunately I have another one for today where I just keep um, four terabytes in my backpack at all times. <laughs> Ooh, that's a lot of TBs. Yeah, I, well, that's one big old drive. So like you're probably good, like you're good for a day's worth of shooting. You can always be like, oh, like if you forget or if you're not thinking about it, you've just always got it in your backpack. This is the new thing to add to the director's kit. Just like, a beefy hard drive that's dedicated just to emergencies for when you need to get footage. Cause I can't tell you how many times I've not done it. And then like, you know, had changes that I would like to make or even not even that just like wanted to introduce it into a uh, sizzle in some way. And like, if you don't have the raw footage, then it's really hard to separate the, you know, the audio from the music track that they've got. And yeah. so then it's really hard to cut into a great sizzle. So, yes, now I'm kind of trying to figure out what's next. I have a few things in the air, but nothing quite scheduled. I still have that pilot for E that they're negotiating with a lead actress right now, and I'm pitching some things, but it's uh, it's been a weird time. And before we get to what you've been working on, because I know it's like uh, 10 times as much, I just want to mention that today is November 5th, and tomorrow is the midterm election and I don't know if our devoted listeners that have been listening since before the 2016 election, I think we did oh, an man. episode about my anxiety about that election. And it's like back in full force, 150%. It's probably back in like 200% because at the last election, I just felt so bowled over by not realizing like what was going on that I, I'm just like really anxious about tomorrow so i'm yeah kind of hoping that after tomorrow i'll be like regardless of what the results are i'll be not thinking about it not reading about it and hopefully be able to like kind of find myself back in a creative space because i've just been really glued to the news yeah it's really hard those anxiety spikes you know there's something you have to temper you there's something you have to like figure out how to work through because it's important to be involved and like educated and active in your community and in the political landscape in general. And also it's important to not let the big picture slow you down from your own creative work. And I think that's a thing that especially during the last, like the presidential election, a lot of people had really hard times with, I my, myself included. I mean, we both were just like strung out for months. You know what I mean? And the difference between us getting caught up in this and other people oftentimes is that we are entirely self-motivated if we don't write if we don't pitch if we don't hustle if we're not out meeting people then you don't generate work whereas like you know if everyone if you have a slow week at the office sometimes like you still got a boss telling you what to do and you're still collecting a paycheck and like maybe your performance is lower and like There are plenty of workplaces where you still are in a very competitive environment, but it's a slightly different deal than like either you're booking jobs or you're not. Matt, 
I've been dying to know. What have you been working on lately? Boy, what have I been working on lately? I kind of have been able to to bounce around a little bit. The my Facebook Watch show is kind of coming to an end, which is uh, both exciting and a little sad. It's funny because I think that I, you always have FOMO, right? You're always like, oh, I'm on this like big long term thing, and I'm missing out on all these other short term things. Um, and then you know, I managed to like do a few short term things uh, while I was still on the show and took some time off to do them. Um, and like, that's equally stressful. So I am in a funny place where I'm really just trying to like, find a few new things to put on my reel before the end of the year and just kind of like coast basically. Um, it's like, where are you with like your personal project, like your TV pitches and those things? (laughs) Well, so the short that I shot um, back in June, I want to say, or July. It yeah. might have been July, actually. Anyway, that is like just so freaking close to being done. It's making me want to pull my hair out. But like with any of those um, passion projects, you know, post tends to run a little longer just because availability slip or and you're not paying anybody anything. And those are always the things that are the most time consuming. So it's like, um, for a while there, it was like you and I were trying to find some time to go get some drone footage. And then finally, like Matt Barber came in and like helped us out with some awesome footage. And then it was like, okay, now I've got to find time to like get that stuff in. But my editor has been on this big job and blah, 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 blah. Certainly I think, I think, I think that listeners can really relate to, but so I'm right there with you, everyone getting those final it's like the last five percent of the job basically is it's so close to being done it's really hard to finish short films when it's you, it's really hard to finish short unless you're submitting you know, to a, sundance that's literally it, what sundance does for people <laughs> it's just the yeah deadline. sundance and south by and it's kind of a bummer because like in terms of premiere dates like besides south by and sundance kind of all of the other festivals have like you know um deadlines around this time give or take a couple weeks and it's just like, I'm so bummed that South By is already closed because I, I just checked on it recently. It was like, oh, no, like, of course it's done because they, they are kicking off the seasons. So like all of those other smaller festivals kind of come thereafter so that there's not as much of a mandate for premiere only status and stuff. So I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to try and um, see if I can uh, talk to somebody over there, but uh, we'll see what happens. And then on the TV front... I have a pitch going out to different pods, basically. So the I sold a show to a subsidiary of a big studio, and that studio therefore has a bunch of like shingles and pods. I don't know what the nomenclature means exactly, but basically little companies that all have deals with said company. Right. So let's say you have a company like a studio like Universal. They have these first look deals with a bunch of production companies. Yeah. And that production company might be just like a showrunner and a development assistant or something. Yeah. Normally it's like a couple people. It's it's like a showrunner or a movie star or somebody like that. And then an assistant and a development person or two. And they're basically like in these little buildings that are either bungalows or more typically, I think, kind of like almost apartment buildings that are two or three stories tall and they're just like little apartments but instead of with people living in them there's tiny little production companies and they all you like when you see the end card on a movie or tv show and it's like a real funny colorful name um right like judd apatow has a a pod yeah 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 normally you see a couple of them right because Mm -hmm. it's like judd apatow also has to partner with Fico, and then, you know, they partner with, right. you know... A, Chuck Lorre's company. Right, exactly. So, depending on how famous you are and how accomplished you are and how good your agent, lawyer, and manager are, it determines how, who gets a card, basically. Um, so, we're out to some fancy people and who are reading. When and, you say um, we, who's we? So, me and the company I sold the show to. Oh, okay. And so, how involved are you? Um, pretty involved. Yeah, pretty involved. So um, I'd written the pilot and the Bible and the leave behind and then worked on a deck for said uh, leave behind. So, you know, it's just kind of like it's the sort of materials that we all talk about. But basically, I'll be pitching in the next few weeks with these companies. And then from that, we'll kind of partner to figure out if it's uh, a good fit in terms of 
uh, attaching talent or if we can just go straight to buyers, basically. Um, so that stuff has kind of all been going on in the background, and I'm trying to spin all the plates at once, basically. I've, I remembered I have one other thing. So this you'll think is really funny. I haven't posted them yet, but so my wife, who's an actor, uh, was getting these new headshots shot relatively recently. And they're kind of like less about being pure headshots of like, hey, this is what I look like, and these are the shortest of characters that I could play. And more about them being a little more theatrical and a little more editorial, you know, like like something that you would maybe see in a magazine or something like that, like a little bit more of a look, a little bit more stylized than like a pure representational headshot. Right. Because she's, you know, like loosely affiliated with this uh, theater group called Antius here in L.A. And like they have like a lot of like serious actors. And so these are like very kind of like moody portraits, basically. And so she was going to go ahead and do them. And it occurred to me that it's been kind of a while since I had any sort of headshot. Um, and, you know, they're handy to have for like... Freaking Matt Enlow. You're just like a master at getting photographs of yourself. Right. Well, but they're all kind of goofy. And I'm always like a little sweaty. And I haven't slept in a couple of days is what most of those photos are like. But so, um, I, my wife had booked this like British photographer. Oh, they're um, the best. With, like shot, shot all of these like great, you know, people. He like shot all these like nerd icons and like all these like British royalty and stuff. He would have them come sit and like, they would do kind of like brooding, like high key sort of like, you know, um, expressive chiaroscuro shots. So, um. So I was like, well, hey, like, like, how much would it be to like add one more look and I'll come and do it? He rented like um, a hotel room up in the valley uh, and he was there for a couple weeks and like had like built out a little studio space and like I went and shot some headshots and it was v- a very strange feeling for me because I ca- immediately like had a lot of notes on his directing. I, was like, <laughs> I don't really know ex- like what you're trying to get out of me. I don't know you're not really being clear. We're not speaking the same language. These are, this is all my internal monologue and I'm just trying to like be in the moment and be easy to direct. But yeah, it was a really fascinating experience. So modeling is freaking hard. Modeling is so hard. I mean, there's some people that are naturally uh, good and looking from every angle, but, but uh, that's what I'm saying. It's not about, cause he's not about shooting, especially flattering shots. That's not what you're looking for. It's not, do you look beautiful or not? Like, he's making you look interesting. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so I'll make sure uh, to post a few of those photos. Um, yeah. No, I'm looking forward to it. Um, Orin, do you have headshots? No, are you kidding? I hate the camera. I have, have a you ton of selfies. About it? Did you? I just sent you a link. Did you see it? <laughs> uh, if you mouse over it, there's like a second shot, too. The, this, is, uh, this is really funny. All right. So, everyone... Oren sent me a link <laughs> to a photo. Uh, these all look great, but Oren is dressed up in like a like a NASA spaceman suit. Mm-hmm. You know, so their whole thing um, was um, they. So there's this company called Global. Uh, wait, you, you? I'm sure you know it. They basically rent space stuff for movies. This LA company, and uh, they rent out all sorts of cool space costumes so this company blue giant they have kind of like a space theme going they had all their directors dress up as various spacemen um yeah so those are handy the thing about them so they're very stylized they're very like oren's literally wearing like a nasa spacesuit and looking off heroically (laughs) um the thing that the difference actually between what i shot and those photos is basically just the propage like like I'm not wearing a costume or anything, so I think they're a tiny bit more universal in that way. Um, but you don't ever want a headshot, Orn? No, I do. I just when I my movie played at like AFI Film Festival, they took headshots of all the directors, and I just I felt like I looked insane in mine. I don't know. I'm just not. I don't really like headshots. I like more action shots. And my the best photos, my favorite photos of myself are as odd as it sounds, are like selfies that sure. I take with my iPhone, so. Well, I mean, I think it makes sense, like, you know, 
you're uh, you're feeling good about the way you look and the light is great and you know you're having a good time so you take a snap of photo so it makes sense that those would be your favorites but I find that it's handy to have a photo for like panels or pamphlets like if you're in like a film festival and they want the the artist bio or whatever like having a photo that looks professional i feel like is useful no absolutely a headshot is very very helpful for, for a director and you don't need to like have some british guy you know pay right. him a couple hundred bucks to shoot a photo in a studio or whatever like you can have like your talented photographer friend take them my previous one was like shot by my like best friend growing up in high school so before we get into our uh, couple listener emails, we want to remind you that we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash justshootitpod. It is a place you can go if you like this podcast, if you like hearing our opinions on things, listening to our guests, going to our live events, uh, you can help support us. A dollar a month, $4 a month, $20 a month, some people are doing. It's awesome. It helps us pay our editors, put on events, which by the way, we're having an awesome event on December 5th at Sawhorse Productions. Uh, it's going to be our big end of the year event that we will tell you way more about later. Uh, but that's what the Patreon goes for. It's just really helping this podcast stay alive. So uh, check it out. Patreon.com slash just shoot a pod. Thanks, everyone. Well, on that note, uh, let's talk about listener questions. Yeah, so our first email comes from Johan Ko. Johan says, I graduated film school two years ago and now make a living by either directing or shooting corporate videos. My end goal is to write and direct short form and long form narratives and documentaries. Welcome to the club, Johan. Uh, however, I realized that I learned how to make films in undergrad film school, but not necessarily story foundations and screenwriting, which I'm working on now. I love school because it gives you a bubble to work and study in. And for this reason, I've been thinking of applying to either an MFA program for screenwriting or maybe save up to make my first indie feature film. Instead, I'd love to hear your opinions. Any insight would be greatly appreciated. So Hmm. uh, MFA or feature film? Or feature film. Boy, that look, uh, Johan, first off, we should just caveat all of these answers with... um, we have no idea. Both, we have no idea. <laughs> Both could really work for you. Like whatever the right the right path is going to be individual for each person. Right. So and we're it, just going to kind of like bullshit a little bit, and then hopefully it, maybe you'll disagree with one of us and agree with the other, and that'll be your way of picking. Yeah. Hopefully I, that's helpful. I like thinking about it as you have two hundred grand. Do you spend it on a master's degree and building out your network and? getting training or do you spend it on a low budget feature film? So my immediate thought yeah. is, do you think that there is a way that you can spend, you can borrow $200,000 rather than saving up for it, right? Which is going to be like saving up $200,000 or raising $200,000 to make a feature um, is very hard. And unfortunately, borrowing $200,000 to go to grad school is uh, a heck of a lot easier in a the short term at the very least though you're saddled with that debt for the rest of your life um do you think you can make a movie while in grad school uh i'm definitely the wrong person to ask about that and i think the answer is obviously yes but no <laughs> uh like both things will suffer and i think it, either investment becomes less valuable i think the answer is you you get your two hundred thousand dollar loan. I would argue, yeah, it may be harder to make a good feature, but I think make in real time making a feature, even a bad one, makes the act of going to grad school more valuable. I I would argue. Again, what what do I know? Yeah, I think you just go to grad school for one year instead of two. Drop out. Spend the rest of your student loans on a feature film. <laughs> I don't Easy. know that that's legal. Next question. <laughs> uh, no, but realistically, I mean, I think we know the answer. It just depends on the type of person you are. If you are super self-motivated, you've got a script, you have actors, you've got a network, you live in a place that can support your feature film on a budget, you have access to equipment or money or whatever it takes, and you think you can make a feature that will launch your career that will get you into a notable film festival or will be seen by the right people to get you the next movie, then do that. If any of those pieces are in doubt, then film school 
you're just a little bit more on rails. You're forced to meet people. You're forced to build a network. You're forced to be with like-minded filmmakers. And ultimately, you end up being poised for the best chances to create a life and career in film. Not to mention you've just dumped whatever, $100,000, $200,000 into your education. You're just that much more motivated to make that investment worth it. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think the the fate of both the student debt crisis and also um, independent film, they're two really tricky situations to be in right now. You know, like school is super expensive and making your money back on an indie film is super hard. I know that that can sound disheartening to people sometimes, um, but there's something weirdly comforting to me about just like knowing that like no matter what, life is hard and like you just have to have an like eyes open sort of philosophy to like jumping in and being as competitive and as hardcore as you can. Well, hopefully that was helpful. Yeah. The wishy-washiest answer in a (laughs) podcast filled with wishy-washy answers. Uh, Godspeed, Johan. Hit us back. Let us know what you decide. I'd love to uh, keep track of what's happening. Yeah. So our next email is from Jake Inslee. Uh, Jake is a writer, director, slash more from Toronto, Ontario. And Jake says, uh, my partner and I have recently had a falling out and decided it's best for us to dissolve our company of three years. My partner is a seasoned DP, and I would direct everything with both of us bleeding into other departments as if we were a team. Uh, Besides little passion projects here and there, I'm not sure how to get back into the game as a freelance writer, director, editor, etc. on my own. Here are a few questions I thought you may be able to help with and may be useful for others too. So let's just, there's three questions. Let's just take them one at a time. Real quick answers. Love it. Number one, how does a director attack an agent or a manager with about 10 to 15 corporate commercials slash interview series and a few short films? From behind. <laughs> just He kidding. says, uh, the industry may be different in Canada versus the US, but any thoughts from your experience would be appreciated. Uh, should I build a personal pitch deck about myself with links to work and send it out? Or should I try to find a marketing agency to hire me as an in-house director and then try to find an agent or manager that way? Uh, So we obviously, we we actually wrote Jake back and gave him our quick answers on this already, which we will reiterate here. But the agent manager thing seems like not the thing to focus on, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a few things to break down there. It's so hard to explain the agent manager thing in a satisfying way because the answer is so unsatisfactory and so different than what you're used to thinking of. You know, like you think you go to Hollywood, you get an agent, they introduce you to all these people and then you book work and then you're rich and famous. And it's the inverse. Like, you book all this agents, work, you get rich and famous, and then agents... And then they're like, hey, I would love 10%, and I'll make more money for you. And maybe they do, and maybe they don't. But like, you know, I, I, when I got my agent, I took meetings all over town, and the one that I booked was the one I didn't take a meeting with and got jealous. He was like, oh, how come Matt hasn't met with me? Right. And that's just because he knew my manager well. It's impossible to replicate and like frustrating to hear about basically is what i'm saying so like just don't worry about it like most people we know are booking all the time with or without agents well so but i do think the useful answer here is that you've got to remember to separate commercial work from like film tv digital episodic narrative work Uh, the manager and the agent is for the latter for tv for film for digital and also marketing yourself to them makes you Makes makes them want you less, right? And so those people That's the point of my can story. give two shits about any of your commercial experience unless you're working with mega stars and doing Super Bowl commercials that are five minutes long, right? And even then, they probably don't care about you that much. Uh, but who does care about commercials are production companies. So that's a much easier path. It, depending on what city you live in, you look at what production companies are making commercials there. You cut a reel and you send emails. They can be unsolicited and say, "Hey." I'm a director looking to work with the company. Are you interested in meeting? Here's my work. And that's it. And it, you can look at what other directors they represent and see if you fit some sort of gap and maybe pitch yourself as like the lifestyle person or the docu-style person or the comedy person. Right. Uh, or or if, you're, if you want to get really tactical about it, you can look at that list and you can say, oh, 
I'm going to do a little Facebook stalking or LinkedIn stalking and see, do I have a connection to one of those directors? Can I take them to coffee? Can we hit it off? And then maybe like get the recommendation from them to like the introduction to the company through that. Yeah. Though recently I've really been thinking a lot about like directors and how there is a limit to how much building other directors careers is helpful to you. Uh, Sure. and, And I don't, I, a lot of times a director isn't that motivated. I've gotten a lot of emails from fellow director friends saying like, Hey, I see you're with the famous group. Like, can you introduce me? And it's never like super easy for me to say like, Oh, you should sign this person, you know, unless they have a need and this person happens to fit it and feed it. And it's not something that I want to be working on. Right. Um, If they're like, Oh, I, we're Oren, we've got all this dramatic documentary work. Do you know any of those people? And yeah. you happen to, then it's an easy yes. Yeah. You reaching out to other directors to get them to recommend you to the production company they're with is, you should definitely do it, but there's other ways that are cleaner to get. Yeah. To you know what? I companies. think we talked about this on the podcast earlier, but like, I think like line producers are a really good group of people to have good relationships with because they do often, they are on jobs before directors are signed on and like can recommend people that they like to work with. Yeah. Any type of producer is really good to be friends with. Uh, and the line producer, I think, tends to be undervalued by other people. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. get a line producer and people are like, oh, line producer, I want to talk to the real producer. EP, you know? regular. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think all producers, maybe even associate producers, they're the people that yeah. whisper things into the producer's ears. Yeah, uh, 100%. I'm saying that a wrong-headed person can underestimate them basically yeah anyway so in terms of an agent and manager uh jake brought up this idea of making this like uh personal pitch deck about himself with links to his work i think that's interesting i think it's not that different than making a squarespace web page for yourself with links to your work uh so yeah i think pitch do whatever you can to pitch yourself to agents and managers if you want but you and I have never seen that successfully lead to a job before. Yeah. I I would go so far as to say that I think it's a great idea to have a cool looking website that has some bells and whistles and shows your creativity. I think if you put that same content into a pitch deck and emailed it to someone, especially if it was coming from you, but even if it was coming from a manager or another director or something like that, I think that more judgmental people would be like, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Like, I think I could imagine a, a world where agents are, like, not into it at all. Like, there's a a sweatiness to it that makes me a little nervous. Yeah. Look, and if it's incredible, like, I, I could be wrong. But, like, again, you have to kind of attract the attention. You have to make agents think that it's their idea to sign you in the first place. Yeah. So courting them is the thing that's... The kiss of death. Well, I had this script uh, that won an award at the Slam Dance pilot competition, screenwriting competition. And after we got that award, there were a bunch of agents and managers that I emailed and said, hey, uh, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. Just wanted to let you know my script just won the Slam Dance pilot award. You know, if you're ever interested in watching or er, er, checking it out, here's the log line. And I think I got about 50% responses. And that was from managers and agents that I actually literally knew had met before over the years. Like literally knew. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, it, and I had a very specific piece of news I wanted to tell them and like a very specific action I was asking them to take. It wasn't like, hey, you want to meet up and see if you like me? It was like, I have this project. It's this cool story. It just won an award, validates it. Do Is it something you're interested in looking at? So it's you're not almost not asking them to rep you. You're asking them to to look at an exciting project you have. Okay, next question. <laughs> that was a quick answer for question one. Uh, question two: Can I use my body of work as examples of my directing skills, or is it in bad taste since we worked on everything as a company? To me, the answer to this is beyond obvious. If you directed it, even if you co-directed it, you can say you directed it. That's all. Yeah. It, it yeah, matters, I understand matters. how you could feel reticent to not to feel like you were taking credit for someone else's work or something like that. 
it's not so much that it's obvious, it's that it is industry standard. You know, like none of the things that Oren or I or any of our peers have done that they are proud of were purely from a single vision and a single effort. No one did all of the art design and starred in and wrote and shot all of their own stuff. Look, maybe some people do that every once in a while. They're kind of like, there are exceptions to that, but that's not what we're saying. Like directing is collaborative. So like just because you didn't shoot something or just because you are no longer partnered with a person, um, if you directed it, then say I directed it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm sure Josh and Vince, the directing duo who had been on our podcast, both used the work they co-directed on their reels. Yeah, definitely. And like, you know, if you feel weird about it, you can say directed by, like, or co-directed in that circumstance. But that's not even what, you yeah, know. I honestly won't even about. waste my time saying something. You don't even worry, worry about it. Yeah, you're A-OK. So um, that's the easy one. Okay, uh, number three. Yeah, number three. Also easy because there's no answer. Have you ever heard of any Canadians breaking into the U.S. market as a director, or should I focus solely on staying here in Toronto? Or move to Vancouver, which is sure. an interesting sub-question. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the difference between those. See, that's why I didn't. I think that Vancouver, has Canadians less chime in here, Vancouver. but I think Vancouver is the bigger production town than Toronto. I think Vancouver, I mean, Vancouver certainly is the one that's, if you're looking to crew, I know a lot of Hollywood shows shoot up in Vancouver. Yeah, in the Toronto Coons. too, though. Toronto's that? huge. I guess that's true, huh? Yeah, and yeah. they have a film festival there too. Uh, and I think it's just a bigger town in general. I'll tell you what. Have you ever been to Vancouver? For like 10 minutes. Dude, so awesome. Like, I'm so into Vancouver. I was like ready to move. It's like oh. a beautiful city. It's got like tons of natural beauty. It's super diverse. It's super metropolitan. Like everything's happening. The food's awesome. Vancouver's great. I should go to Toronto. Maybe I'd like that too. Um, well, yeah. Toronto, Vancouver, LA. I think wherever you feel most confident about building your network and being comfortable and having having the runway to get up to speed with people and projects and whatever makes you happy is fine. I, uh, I know we push LA a lot, uh, but I don't think Vancouver or Toronto are any worse than LA. And I think Toronto, especially if that's where you are and that's where all your connections are, it's probably worth are. continuing to work there. Yeah, I would say just to broaden it out to any person who is thinking about moving from one down to another, you have to think of what are your ultimate aspirations? And then ask yourself, are those, that level of those projects, are they being created and executed in your town? So if the answer is like, you know what? I love doing like big budget, but local spots for my hometown. Like that sounds really cool to like work on. Like there's plenty of six figure budgets out there for like regional campaigns are local directors getting to do those if the answer is yes then you know stick around if you want to make a marvel movie then you know you have to be more realistic about who's getting hired to do those movies and where those people meet and live basically and i think that there's a lot of real value to uh there's a lot of value in building out a community and a support system in a smaller market and like cutting your teeth and then moving up to a more competitive space. But also like if you wait too long, it gets harder to enter that stream basically. Yeah. But again, of those three cities, Toronto, Vancouver, and LA, I think they're all big markets. Sure. But only one city, for instance, makes Marvel movies, even though they shoot elsewhere i know but the people they hire to make those movies might have had some giant hit at tiff and be toronto right. filmmakers right but you don't have to have a movie shot in toronto to have a hit at tiff no but you know you don't need to have a movie shot in la to have a hit at tiff that's true that's what i'm saying but so like if your goal is have a hit at tiff then definitely like you can live anywhere maybe but like if you want to make the biggest movies in the world, then you kind of have to go where those movies are being created, basically. Well, cool. Well, so the one last thing Jake says, which I think is interesting, is he had attached his resume and he said, if you have the time and patience, I've attached my director's resume and hopes you tell me if it's good to use or way off base. 
And uh, I checked it out. It was fine. But in general, I think directors' resumes are pretty useless. Just make a website. Um, yeah, just make a website. I, because we have IMDb. And so that's one thing. And then you have your website is the other thing. And also, Oren, can you think of the last time you had to send someone a resume? I mean, when I worked like an office job. I mean, I've sent uh, film resumes when I was first starting out because I was like, oh, I made this short film and played at this film festival. And it was with this production company. None of those, none of the three things that you had ever heard of, I thought was impressive yeah. that I made a film that played at a film festival, but it wasn't. Like, I don't think my resume ever impressed anyone. Yeah, I think I've made one maybe once every two years or three years, like some, but for what someone will specifically ask for it in a weird way. Yeah, I just send a bio and links to work. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Cool. Well, thanks, Jake, for all the questions. I hope our answers were not too <laughs> verbose. <laughs> uh, just two more emails real quick. These are more notes. Christopher from Oriate Films says, hey, I listened to the episode with Augustine Frizzell and Jessica Sanders, and I think during one of them you asked if there's a good way to look who holds the rights to any given property, and there actually is one. Check out uh, rightscenter.com, R-I-G-H-T-S, center.com. It's a film directory people use on the tracking boards I'm on to see who has the rights to various literary works. So thanks for that tip, Christopher. Hey, Chris, thanks, man. That's pretty awesome. I think it was the Jessica Sanders one, and it is a thing that I think about all the time. Like, I wonder if this dumb comic book has been licensed. <laughs> yeah. Well, it probably has. Since probably. It's dumb. Yeah. Um, Almost definitely. And then finally, we have an email from listener Kyle McConaughey. Kyle says, your podcast is a game changer. I just found it last week, and I'm already several episodes in. One of my favorite pastimes is listening to WTF interviews from directors. But being able to listen to interviews from non-famous directors is even more amazing. I'm working on my first feature, so it's so encouraging and informational to hear their stories. Thank you so much for doing this, Kyle. Uh, I just loved Kyle's excitement by the lack of fame our guests have. Uh, (laughs) I wanted to read his email on the air. Uh, Well, if you have any questions, comments, etc., we would love to hear them. Uh, It's fun to hear from our listeners. Today at Starbucks, I ran into one of our listeners. He came up and oh. was like, hey, are you Oren? Which uh, one? Uh, he's actually a listener that we'd emailed with a bunch. His name is Mark Grumbleski. Grumbleski. Oh, cool. I forget how do you pronounce his last name. But uh, Mark G. And then on my birthday, also, uh, someone had left a message on my Facebook page. Uh, a guy named Michael Gallagher, who's this filmmaker that's made a bunch of features and sure. one of the original founders of Maker Studios. Yeah. And he, I haven't talked to him for a while, but he wrote on my Facebook page, happy birthday. I feel like I hang out with you because I listen to your podcast. So, Oh, look at that. We should have him on the show. Yeah. So, you know, it's fun to hear from people. Uh, Yeah. It's super helpful to us, actually, to know what you're liking and not liking and so forth. I Uh, feel like I should tell people that I'm going to hang out at a certain coffee shop for about a year's worth of episodes, <laughs> and then maybe I'll start running into people. Yeah. Uh, Starbucks Reserve. Oh, by the way, have you been there recently? No, I know you've texted me about the, oh, the yeah, crazy they change-ups. It. Yeah, they rearranged my favorite Starbucks Reserve in Los Feliz, and it is way less amazing than it used to be. Some I'm so sorry. Some bonehead right? at Starbucks decided that they should have all the retail section, like the mugs and things you can buy, as close to the counter as possible, because apparently they wanted people to actually buy them. <laughs> Uh, but it like ruined the feng shui of the whole place. And now the couches are all awkward and stacked on top of each other. And it's just way less comfortable. That said, I did work there for like four hours this morning and I wrote oh, good. a pretty fun spec script. So I'm excited. Anyway, just for a spec commercial, nothing too long. But anyway, on that note, we should end this podcast with our unpaid endorsements. Unpaid endorsements. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go first because I think you have real ones. And this is uh, one that I mean truthfully, but is not about filmmaking exactly. So my wife uh, was at the grocery store and like someone was like handing out samples and they were like, oh, do you want a sample? And she was like, uh, I guess. And she bought the product, took it home. She was so excited about it. And then I was like, oh, cool. You bought this thing. And she was like, no, try it. 
So it's sound, I'm, well, all of which is just say it sounds totally mundane, but like as soon as you have it, you're like, why haven't I had this my entire life? Tapatio infused hummus. Hmm. Okay. It is so good. Where did you get it? At the grocery store. The grocery store? Like Von's? John's. John, oh, we went to John's. The bottom of the barrel of groceries. I know. I know. Well, we were looking for specific ingredients and they kind of weren't in the other store. So we were like, we'll give it a shot at John's. Listen, shout out to John's and Tapatio Hummus. It's just a little bit of hot sauce. I'm sure you could make it yourself. I'm sure What's it's as simple as um, it's not Sabra. It's uh, the other big hummus brand. I can't remember. It's, I thought I had it with me, but I just look. It look. It's got like the Tapatio man on the top of the seal. Okay, I will check it out. I love both those things very much, dude. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, cool. Well, what you got? I have two quick ones, also not filmmaking related. One is the Sky Couch. If you need to fly overseas, check out Air New Zealand. They have this thing for like a hundred bucks. You can upgrade your three seats to a Sky Couch, and oh. uh, they just add this like giant footrest to each of the seats, and they fold them up, and they give you a mattress, and you basically. Have a bed that you can sleep like two people can spoon each other. If you have a kid, you can put it there. And then for another $149, they'll give you the seat across the aisle. So you have four seats or one seat plus the sky couch. So it's amazing for a couple traveling with kids or just by themselves. Uh, It's super affordable. So you're saying for an extra $250, you you have a bed basically and then also one seat? Yeah. This is on top of buying three tickets sure 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 yeah but i guess i'm confused as to how it's so cheap to just get one more seat for 150 that seems crazy yeah i know i guess if supplies allow it look at that yeah yeah it has to be available uh and on the way there to london we got it with an extra seat on the way back we didn't and i wanted to add the extra seat and then it wasn't available but in the end they managed to rearrange Mm, the that's people nice. on the plane and we got it and you're like perfect Kara and winter you guys sit in the seat i need to starfish you joke but there was a quite a big segment of the flight when <laughs> i was on the bed and i felt really guilty because all these people were walking by and they're like you put your daughter on and your wife in the seat i'm like they want to sit there and i'm just like <laughs> laying sprawling out on this bed on my laptop they also had yeah. like wi-fi transatlantic wi-fi it was cool i was emailing that's- you guys Boy, it's crazy. We're living in the future. Yeah. Sky couch. Sky couch. My other thing real quick, just because I was talking about politics earlier, is I just started uh, using this new political news site. It's called realclearpolitics.com. And it is, they're kind of famous for their polling aggregation. Yeah. I think my wife and I were just talking about this one. But they also aggregate news. And it's, of all the news sources I've found is by far the most even because there isn't really like an unbiased news source. There's just bias to the left and bias to the right and extremes of those. Right. So what real clear politics.com does is it just links to a bunch of articles, but they're pretty evenly distributed between left and right. And today, the night before the election, like there's a bunch of articles from right leaning sources that say like hey you're everyone's going to be shocked the republicans are going to keep the house and are going to do this and here's all the proof and then you know the new york times and all the left-leaning sources are like the democrats have the house pretty much uh so you know it it's it i feel weird when i am getting all my news from like one slant and it makes me feel uh definitely way more anxious <laughs> but also like i'm a little more attached to everyone in america yeah as opposed to just the people that agree with me you did just make me legitimately a little bit dizzy (laughs) well see it's bad we should all be not dizzy and just we're thinking about like the next episode of the voice yeah um okay well that's all i got we'll see you tomorrow two hours to november 6th good luck everyone look by the time this episode airs the midterms will have already come and gone and Someone yeah, will, will be worried about the next and... presidential election. Yeah. We'll be on to 2020. Um, yeah. I'm I'm just going to book a, 
a sky couch, and then I'll just be a, like in a snow piercer. It'll just be a plane that just kind of flies around the world over and over again, and yeah. we'll be fine. And I'll eat bugs, and I won't mind. Anyway, okay, cool. Well, thanks for listening. This episode was edited by Jay McAuliffe. Our producer is Madeline Roswat. Our webmaster is Ewan Williams. The music you're listening to is from the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. And your iTunes review is our favorite thing, so please leave one. It helps people find the podcast. And that's it. Email us. That's all we got. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.